Hello and welcome back to World Cultures. This is Lecture Series 3, Part 3. In this section, we will be defining and examining a few horticulturalist societies. Now, so far, we have just looked at food gathering societies. Now, we are going to look at food producing societies. Now, the shift from hunting and gathering to food producing occurred 10,000 years ago and was called the Neolithic Revolution. The earliest known plant and animal domestication occurred in the Middle East in a region called the Fertile Crescent. This area includes parts of Jordan, Israel, Syria, southeastern Turkey, northern Iraq, and western Iran. The first domesticated animal and plant species were dog, sheep, goats, wheat, and barley. Now, the domestication of crops and livestock developed independently outside of the Fertile Crescent. Around the same time as uh, the domestication in the Fertile Crescent, villagers in China were also raising millet and rice. 5,000 years ago, the Sub-Saharan Africa had plant and animal domestication as well. Central Mexico cultivated squash, chilies, beans, and millet 5,000 years ago. And corn was developed from a wild grass called teosinte around 7,000 years ago in North America. And between 3,000 and 7,000 years ago, the first cultivated potato appeared in southern Peru and northeastern Bolivia. Now, it is worth noting that there has been no unified answer as to why the Neolithic Revolution took place. There are several theories in place, but pro the primary theme is that times were good. Populations increased, and they needed to adapt to the need of more food. Now, what are some changes that result from changing from food gathering to food producing? Food production led to a dramatic increase in population. The cultivation of food followed for greater food storage resulting in less frequent times of hardship, and thus people were less concerned with food procurement and they could specialize in non-food producing activities. So, for the first time, people became specialists and inventors. Now, it's not all good though. With humans needing to be stationary, the spread of communicable diseases increased dramatically. Until now, populations were not as dense, and the spread of sickness was easily halted. Also, early farmers were limited on what they could grow, which in some cases led to malnutrition because they only had access to certain nutrients. Finally, the production or food production had a dramatic impact on social structures. Until now, most societies were egalitarian. This was replaced by increasing social inequality and other problems such as poverty, crime, war, aggression, and environmental degradation. Now, horticulturalist societies. The first of the food producing strategies that we are going to look at in this course is horticulture. Now, horticulture, also known as subsistence agriculture or small holder agriculture, is small scale, low intensity farming on small plots. So, horticulture is defined as 
small scale, low intensity farming on small plots. It involves the use of basic hand tools, such as hoes and digging sticks, rather than machinery and plows. Now, because horticulture is small scale, the products of it are often consumed by the household, and this doesn't leave much room for stockpiling. Now, some horticulturalists also raise animals, such as pigs and chickens. They raise them for food and as well as prestige. Most horticultural societies still supplement their diet with hunting and gathering. Today, we find horticulture practiced among backyard gardeners and those who have transformed their yards into edible landscapes. Relying primarily on their own labor to plant and harvest for home consumption, these gardeners are providing families with fresh, homegrown produce. Now, horticulture still exists as a subsistence strategy in South and Central America, as well as in certain areas of Central Africa, Southeast Asia, and Melanesia. In addition to land, tool, and knowledge, Horticultural horticulturalists often require storage facilities. In such societies, land tends to be communally owned by an extended kin group. Although, rights to use a piece of land may be given to households or even individuals. For example, among the Ibo in Nigeria, no individual owns land or has permanent rights to it. Instead, the land is vested in kinship groups and allocated to individuals by leaders of these groups. But even the group that has the rights to use the land may not dispose of it as well. The land is inalienable and may not be sold. With this type of land ownership, few people are deprived of access to basic resources because almost every person belongs to a land holding group within the society. Now, in societies based on horticulture, the work involving what the work involved in clearing, cultivating, and maintaining the land is a large investment and is more important than exclusive title to the land. So the rights to cleared and productive land and to the products of that land are vested in those who work it. This is often the domestic group or household. Now, because the user of the land may die while the land is still productive, some system of inheritance of use of rights is usually provided for. Among the Lacandon Mayan in the highlands of the Chiapas in New Mexico, individuals may farm any unused piece of land. However, clearing virgin land is very difficult. So, individuals retain rights to land that they have cleared and are likely to reuse, even if it is not currently in production. People who migrate from the area may lose rights to land they have cleared, but their family retains ownership of any fruit trees that have been planted on it. So should a man die after investing time and labor in clearing and planting land, his wife and children retain the rights to use the land. Now, where population densities are low, or large areas of land are available for cultivation, the rights to land use are very loosely held. But when geographical conditions limit the amount of land available, or when population pressure increase, 
land shortages do occur. In these cases, the problem is often dealt with by warfare. Now, there are certain traits that we can assume or derive from horticulturalist economies based on their tendencies. First, they tend to live on land that is communally controlled usually by an extended kinship group. Also, small family units retain rights as long as they work the land and are in good standing with the larger family. And lastly, there are no advantages to owning land that can't be used permanently. Now, in this section, we're going to be looking at the Azande, the Yanomami, and the Homong. Now, some other examples of horticulturalist societies are the Kaluli, Samoans, and the Trobrianders. First, the Azande. The Azande people live in a large area in Central Africa, overlapping the boundaries of three different countries, southwestern Sudan, the eastern edge of the Central African Republic, and the northeastern portion of the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. Zande settlements occupy an area of rolling hills with abundant rivers and streams. Now, on the banks of these waters grow tall trees providing shade in which to build homesteads. The Zande homesteads were traditionally located at a distance from one another, with close families connected by footpaths winding through the grasslands. However, the Azande fell victim to a sleeping sickness spread by the tsetse fly, which was breeding in their local waters. Because of this, the colonial authorities forced them to relocate to concentrated settlements near roads. The closeness of the houses in these new settlements was especially problematic. This was problematic because witchcraft plays a prominent role in Zande life. And the structures along the riverbanks, which could be spread far apart, afforded protection from neighbors' potential witchcraft, which was only effective at close range. The peoples known collectively as the Azande are a melding together of what were separate clans in the past. In earliest times, the clans who lived along the banks of the waters were independent local groups, and clan disputes were settled within the families of which they were composed, and disputes between clans were settled by elders from each. Now, Zande history tells of a single individual, through his wisdom and kindness, gained power within his own clan, the Avangara. Soon, under his leadership, it became the dominant group. Moving eastward along the riverbanks, the Avangara conquered more than 50 other clans and eventually merged into the Zande group. The name Zande means the people who possess much land. In the late 19th century, French and Belgium expeditions had set up military outposts in the Sudan. By the early 20th century, the Zande district was under British rule, which lasted until 1953. In that year, growing Sudanese nationalism led to Britain's granting of self-government. Sudan claimed independence shortly after in 1956 setting into motion a succession of unstable parliamentary governments and military regimes. 
fundamentalist Islamic law was instituted in 1983 and was followed by a series of civil wars among Sudanese of various religions, ethnic, and political allegiances. Now, the settlement patterns of the Azande. Traditionally, Azande homes are built of mud and grass framed on wooden poles and thatched with grass. In addition to this living space, each household unit has a granary for storing millet. Houses are built around courtyards, which provide ideal places for gathering and conversation. Their upkeep is critical because they are seen as evidence of responsibility or, industri or industriousness of their owners. Now, since each woman must own her own house and granary, a polygynous household will have numerous homes with granaries around its courtyard. In a monogamous household, the average courtyard space is about 65 feet in its largest dimension. Households with more adult women may have yards that are 100 square feet. And courtyards belonging to the households of chiefs are double this size. Now, in addition to this, they also have kitchen gardens, which are planted adjacent to the courtyards. Now, these are used for plants that don't require large-scale harvesting or attention, such as pineapple, mango, papaya, and miscellaneous perennial plants. Now, these are used for meals immediately upon picking. Now, next is subsistence and manufacturing of the Azande people. The Azande practice shift cultivation and rely mostly on maize, millet, gourds, pumpkins, manioc, bananas, ground nuts, and beans. Now, as I mentioned before, the titi fly is problematic to animals as well as humans, which makes cattle herding impossible. So, whatever meat is consumed is secured through hunting. There is also a tradition of using forested areas to gather plants that they do not cultivate. Dogs and chickens are the only domesticated animals. The year consists of two seasons, one rainy and one dry. During the rainy summer, Azande cultivate their land. Although they have a long growing season and no frosts, the soil is not rich and insects are troublesome. As the hot dry weather begins, crops mature and are harvested. Hunting was most feasible in the dry season, when tall grasses had died or were burned, and when the harvest was over, because during the rains, vegetation was too dense to allow necessary visibility for hunting. And since the rivers were low during the dry season, fish were more, or fish were more accessible. Now, men employed basket traps, which they could set in the rapids of rivers, and women dammed the streams into small shallow pools, and then they would drain them by bailing and collect the fish, snakes, and crustaceans that remained. Termites were also a favorite food, and because of their high fat and protein content, made them a nutritious part of their diet. Next, we're going to look at the Azande Social and Political Organization. Among 
the Azande. Clan affiliation was not stressed at the local level. Anthropologist by the name of Evans Pritchard. Uh, he is the ethnographer who is most responsible for knowledge about the Azande. Well, he found, uh, as he, you know, gathered the genealogies of this group, that except in the royal clan, genealogical relationships between clansmen were very seldom known and usually quite untraceable. So for these people, the only clan that really mattered to them was that of the royal clan. Now, in pre-European times, the Azande were organized into a number of chiefdoms, sometimes called kingdoms, each of which was independent from the others. The Avangara were nobility, and in the days of Zande chiefdoms, it was to Avangara lineages that chiefs belonged. Despite the fact that chiefs of different groups all belonged to the same clan, there was ongoing hostility and warfare among them. Chiefs ruled their lands and peoples by appointing emissaries. And these were typically sons, but they were always Avangara. Now these emissaries were sent out to manage various sections of their territories. Within these communities, commoners were deputized to aid in administration. Now, chiefs functioned as military leaders. They also functioned as economic leaders and political leaders. And any unmarried man were recruited into groups that functioned both as warriors and as laborers to the king's land. The governors of the territories had gardens that were also worked by these troops. Both governors and chiefs collected food from the peoples in their domain, and the local governors would send the chief a portion of their tribute as well. Now this uh, portion would often be redistributed by the chief to the rest of his people. In addition to food, spears and other items, often payment for fines or bride wealth, were redistributed by the chief as well. Now, traditionally, the instigation for marriage among the Azande came from the potential groom. When a man wanted to marry a woman, he asked an intermediary to approach her father with his offer. Now, unless the suitor was deemed undesirable immediately, the father would discuss matters first with his brothers and sisters, and then next with the woman in question. If she was agreeable, the money sent with the intermediary was accepted. And several days later, the suitor would visit his promised bride's parents. He would bring them gifts and demonstrate his respect. In turn, their daughter visited her suitor's home for a quote-unquote trial period of several weeks, after which she returned to her parents' home to make her final decision regarding the marriage. Now, during the time spent in reflection by the woman, the groom-to-be consulted oracles to determine whether their marriage would be a happy one. If both oracle and woman regarded the match favorably, the bride's family traveled back to home of the groom, where the ceremony took place. The marriage would be sealed with the installation of the new bride's own cooking hearth. Now, the Azande are perhaps better known 
for their pervasive belief in witchcraft than any other aspect of their culture. Now, witchcraft is thought to be an actual physical property residing inside some individuals who may themselves actually be unaware of their power. Now, this, this witchcraft substance called mangu can be inherited, passed from father to son and mother to daughter. And because this property is, isn't it's organic, it, it can grow as the person grows. Therefore, an older witch is a more dangerous witch. And children, whose witchcraft substance is small, are never accused of major acts of harm, such as murder. They can, however, cause minor misfortunes in other children. Now, sorcery differs from witchcraft in that it is an art that is learned and deliberately practiced. Unlike sorcery, which employs charms and spells, witchcraft is developed by sheer will. Witches send the spirit of their own witchcraft entity to eat the flesh and organs of their intended victims. Thus, a witch may be at home asleep at the time illness or injury occurs. It is the soul of the witchcraft that travels through the night. However, this substance cannot travel great distances. And it is for this reason that the Azande feel more secure if they are able to live a distance from their neighbors. Now, the short-range nature of witchcraft allows the perpetrator to be more accurately identified. Although, beyond the limits of the witchcraft's capabilities, even with evil intent, may be eliminated. If a person is taken ill while traveling, it is that location where the illness struck in which the witch must be found. Now, the Azande believe that witchcraft is at the base of all misfortune, be it great or small. So if a potter opens his kiln only to discover his pottery cracked, he intimates witchcraft. If a child stubs her toe at play, she suspects witchcraft. If a hunter is gored by an elephant, he blames the injury squarely on a witch. Now, the Azande entertain no concept of accidental death. People die only as a victim of murder, whether committed by witches or by the magic of revenge reserved for the retaliation against suspected witches. Now, despite these convictions, the Azande people do not live in constant terror of witches. In fact, Evans Pritchard's assessment of the Azande was that they were the happiest and most carefree people of the Sudan. And he quotes them, The feelings of the Azande man on finding that he has been bewitched are not of terror, but hearty indignation as one of us might feel on finding himself the victim of embezzlement. The next society that we are going to look at are the Yanomami. Now, the Yanomami are a tribe of about 26,000 individuals who live in about 25 wide, or 250 widely dispersed villages in Brazil and Venezuela. Although they are well known to students of anthropology, owning largely to the lifelong study of Napoleon Ch Chagnon, they have remained remarkably isolated and undisturbed until very recently. While some sources claim there is a, theirs is a history of very little contact 
and retention of indigenous patterns. Others report that the Yanomami had been influenced by European contact since the early 17th century, when Spanish, Portuguese, and Dutch slave traders entered their territory. Moreover, contact continued after tra uh, slave trading times, with missionaries being chief among those with whom the Yanomami have dealt closely. Now, in any case, the most recent contact with gold miners has been dramatic and a cause for international outcry. The tropical forest in which the Yanomami live is dense and green, with varied growth. Its thick floor of vines and shrubs make it difficult to traverse, and on cloudy days, the impenetrable canopy keeps out most light. Now, the villages are at varying distances from one another, and have varying degrees of social closeness. Those that harbor good relations host frequent visitors, and it is not unusual for individuals to travel several days just to pay a visit. Now, currently, the vast majority of Yanomami, more than 95%, live within the Amazon forest and rely on both foraging and horticulture. The remainder have settled along rivers where fishing has replaced hunting. Now, for those Yanomami who are forest dwellers, the abundant jungle supplements their diet. Ordinarily, a tribal society settled in villages. The Yanomami, however, exploit the wild foods found in their environment by trekking, mostly during the dry seasons. They break into small family groups to go off on collecting expeditions, traveling for several weeks when the jungle fruits and vegetables are ripe. Now on these treks, the honey is the ultimate wild prize, and honeycombs are often consumed with the larvae still inside. Now an anthropologist by the name of Good estimates that roughly 40% of their time is spent on a Wayumi, or trek. Now, game is plentiful during these expeditions, so they commonly hunt wild pigs, birds, monkeys, deer, rodents, anteaters, and armadillos. Now, they also collected, to round out the protein portion of their diet, insects and shellfish. Now, fish typically do not provide an extensive portion of the inland Yanomami diet, but when the rainy season is over, and pools formed by overflowing rivers dry out, stranded fish can be opportunistically gathered by women. Now, this practice includes the use of mild poisons. What they do is they introduce it into the water upstream, and the drugged fish float to the surface where they are easily grabbed and tossed into baskets. Larger fish, which are less stunned by the poison, are bitten behind the head by the women and killed. The bulk of the Yanomami food, more than 80%, is grown in their village gardens. Garden sites are cleared by cutting down trees and brush and burning them. Large tree trunks that have been felled but are too wet to burn are simply left where they fall, and are either used as firewood once dry, 
or allowed to serve as a boundary marker between the gardens of different families. The size of a garden plot is usually dictated by the size of the family it must feed. So the larger the family, the larger the plot. Now, because the village headmen will have the responsibility of entertaining visitors and sponsoring feasts, they plant and care for larger plots. The plantain is the most important domesticated crop. Manioc, taro, and sweet potatoes are also cultivated. Cane is used in arrow manufacture and is also grown in the village gardens. Now, tobacco is a crop of central importance. All women, all men, and children, they all chew it daily and guard it jealously. Adults will often have wads of the soft leaves rolled into their lower lips all day long. In fact, it is so important to the Yanomami that it is the only crop that is fenced. It's fenced off to warn against potential thieves. Now, the value of tobacco is evidenced by the fact that the local word for being poor is literally without tobacco. They also grow cotton. Cotton grown in village gardens is used predominantly for the construction of hammocks, which are owned by everyone. It is also used to make what little clothing is worn. Men typically wear little more than a string around the waist, while the, while the women generally wear more ornate belts. You can also see strands of cotton around the wrists and ankles. Now, the Yanomami are generally egalitarian in that there is no ranked hierarchy. While women hold less status than men among adult males, prestige is achieved and not ascribed. And there are as many prestigious positions as there are people to fill them. However, Yanomami villages generally do have a head man, an individual who usually belongs to the largest kin group and represents the village. He serves more as a representative of his own village in dealing with other villages rather than as an authoritarian figure. They act as hosts and negotiators. Their opinion carries somewhat more weight than others. They also lead by example and not by decree. If there is trouble within the village, it is the headman's responsibility to attempt to restore order. Because he must be the model of behavior, he must you know, often put his life at risk in order to show others what must be done. He must demonstrate the bravery, self-control, or industriousness that he expects others to display. Now, the daily life differs greatly for Yanomami men as it does for Yanomami women. Girls are aware at an early age that they have far less social room in which to maneuver than do their brothers. And as such, they begin to assume a productive role in their household very early on, and assume child care responsibilities while they themselves are small children. Most girls are betrothed while they are still quite young, and they have no opportunity to voice any preference in this regard. 
The men to whom they are promised are usually much older. In some cases, a man identifies a girl and asks his relatives to make marriage inquiries. She may then be raised, to some extent, by the man who is to become her husband. Now, regardless of the age at which she is promised, a girl does not generally take up residence with her husband until reaching puberty. Even when their marriage officially begins, life changes very little for the Yanomami girl. She still continues to spend her days as she has previously done, collecting firewood, cooking, and devoting herself to the needs of others around her. One aspect of her marital relationship, which does appear to be quite unique to the husband, is the physical cruelty to which Yanomami women are subjected to by their husbands. This is commonplace and expected behavior. Women are physically disciplined by their husbands for a host of infractions, ranging from being too slow to prepare a meal to suspected infidelity. And punishments run the range from blows with firewood or axes, burns and arrow wounds to murder. Women often depend on their brothers to protect them from an unusually cruel husband, and despair of being promised to a man in another village where they will be separated from this potential source of protection. Now, although women appear to gain no social status from the transition from single girls to married women, they are afforded more respect and fear less for their safety as they age. Elderly women can travel even between warring villages without fearing harm, which is more than they can be assured in their own homes when they are young wives. Now boys are socialized early into this behavior through the encouragement that they receive to strike others especially little girls, when they are angry. Boys, as young as four or five, are well aware of their license to inflict blows on the hapless girls in the village, and are cheered on by their parents and others who often goad them into doing this behavior during play. However, once he is grown, a woman's brother assumes the aforementioned expected responsibility to protect her from the mistreatment of others. Now, play lasts nearly twice as long for boys as it does girls. While a girl of 10 spends the bulk of her day as a worker, boys in their late teens may still be enjoying childhood. And this often causes difficulties because boys of this age expend much effort attempting to seduce girls of their own age, who generally are married women and often have several children. The next culture we're going to look at are the Hmong. The Hmong are a tribal people who have traditionally lived in isolated mountain villages throughout China, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. Originating in southern China, the Huang were historically referred to as Miao or Miao, meaning primitive or barbarian, by the outsiders, which is a derogatory label that they reject. Hmong is their own word, meaning free people. Now, the Hmong tells tales of an ancestral past in a land of ice and snow and perpetual darkness, leading some to suggest European ancestry, assuming the stories are of Siberia. Now, Chinese literature mentions the Hmong as early as the 27th century BC, when they lived along the basins of the Yellow 
and Yangtze rivers of several centuries. Now, relations between the Huang and the Chinese were never friendly. Hmong choose to retain their own way of life, preferring their own food, dress, language, and music over that of the Chinese, who attempted to incorporate or at least influence them. Now, emperors set up singularly punitive rules for the unruly Hmong, who wanted nothing more than to be left alone. Over hundreds of years, the Hmong skirmished with the Chinese, settling and resettling to avoid extermination. In the 16th century, the Ming Dynasty constructed a wall, 100 meters, I'm sorry, constructed a wall 100 miles long and 10 feet high in an attempt to contain the Hmong in one area. In the 18th century, bloody battles were a regular occurrence. By the mid-19th century, Chinese practices drove many Hmong out of the north from fertile lands to the rugged mountains southward and from there to mountainous regions across Southeast Asia. Now, facing massacre and unwilling to give up their way of life, they chose poor mountainous terrain because its inaccessibility afforded them greater safety. In the 1890s, in the 1890s, the French took control of Indochina levying oppressive taxes on the population. Now, the Hmong in Laos, no strangers to conflict with oppressive authorities, rebelled. And in 1896, they refused to pay what they considered extortion. Now, armies were sent into the mountains to intimidate the Hmong. Well, the Hmong organized resistance force and leading to an eventual ceasefire ordered by the French authorities. Now, a second uprising, far more serious than the first, took place from 1919 to 1921, and it was dubbed the Madman's War, largely because the rebel leader, Pa Che, was said to climb trees in order to quote-unquote receive his military orders directly from heaven. Now, others bristle at this designation, claiming it makes light of a valiant attempt to resist colonial oppression. The Hmong insurrection was successful enough to lead the French government to grant them special administrative status which was essentially an official policy granting the Hmong their centuries-old wish to be left undisturbed in the mountains with no forced participation in any world but their own. Now, peace prevailed only until the 1940s, when both World War II and the war in Southeast Asia would prove disastrous for the Hmong. Now, the Hmong village. Let's start with the Hmong houses or seves, which vary based on location and climate. In Thailand and Vietnam, where villages are at low elevations and thus warmer, houses are often built on stilts above the damp ground to keep them drier and breezier. They are reached by wooden steps or bamboo ladders. Raised houses also provide distance from snakes and insects, while adding covered storage space. So the sev is framed in bamboo, lashed together and covered with grasses, straw, or even a uh, woven cut bamboo. The roofs themselves are thatched shingles. Houses in Laos, by contrast, are built directly on the ground often of wooden planks or split bamboo. The floor is packed earth 
and the roof is thatched with large leaves. Laotian sevs are constructed with heavy support beams, the most important of which is the center. The center beam is home to a domestic spirit which guards the house, and it is honored by bearing the placenta of a baby boy under the floor near its base. In the main room of the house is the cooking hearth with altars lining one wall. There is storage space in the attic, and some subs have, house, uh, have a house granary inside. Uh, others have rice and corn storage in an adjacent building. Married couples have rooms off the center room, and visitors are accommodated by sleeping platforms that jut out from the walls. Mats of rice straw are coiled into seats, and large woven baskets serve as storage. Garden plots outside the house are fenced off with bamboo sticks to prevent hungry pigs from eating the family's produce. Now, the arrangement of houses in a village is never random, and often entails divination as well as practical considerations. When planning the construction of a new sev, the first requirements are that it be near the rise, or source of water, and the houses of family members. After those features are in place, a ceremony is performed to ascertain the spiritual stability of the location. Now, one method is to place a small pile of uncooked rice in the proposed location of the center pillar. The rice is then covered and left overnight. If it is there in the morning, unmoved, the spirits have approved of the site. Alternatively, another method, is a pre-measured stick of wood can be positioned in the central pillar's hole. If it is longer by morning, the house may be built. Now, construction is done communally and generally takes three or four men the better part of two weeks. Now, the Hmong uh, exhibit patrilineal clans. The meaning of individual households and village differs for Hmong as compared with their countries or other ethnic groups. For most other groups, villages provide the most important organizing principle. The holding of ancestral land connects individual households and their members. For the Hmong, their migratory lifestyle and clan organization have resulted in a different set of priorities. Hmong villages have been described as having a relatively lack of cohesion as compared with those of other groups in Laos with the focus directed more toward individual households. Now, this is a result of two factors. One, the mobility demanded by a slash and burn economy. And two, a patrilineal clan organization. Now, children are members of their father's clan or zim. And despite the fact that mobility means that clans are very widely dispersed over great distances, exogamy is very strictly practiced. Clan membership takes precedence over regional or village loyalties, and this solidarity is one of great importance given among migratory patterns. So when the head of a household decides it is time to move on, 
he will contact clan members in the new village and obtain advice and sponsorship for the move. When Hamong are traveling through a village, even one in which they know no one, they may locate members of their own zim and be assured hospitality. Now, patrilineal clans are further divided into lineages, or quiv -ti. And these ties are dependent upon for economic help and daily assistance. In some ways, the lineage functions as a large extended family. While in other groups, lineages may be traced back over many generations. Hmong lineages rarely ever reckoned beyond three generations, meaning the common ancestor may in fact be living in the household. Lineage members are those who help move a household, provide rice, or even money during difficult times, or share land. But mutual assistance is often secondary to social, emotional, and spiritual value of lineage connections. The Hmong say that they are only happy when they are near their family. Each Hmong household is something of a self-contained unit. The oldest married man is generally considered the head and is owner of all material goods, from livestock and land to the items in the house itself. As the individual who is responsible for the family's welfare, he decides when the land is exhausted and it's time to move on. Now, household size varies from married couple and their young children to units that include married children and widowed elderly family members. All members must be of the same clan. However, Zim spirits do not allow members of different clans to reside together. The fact that individual households are the focus of Hmong social and economic life and that villages create no particular attachments is demonstrated in the fact that the Hmong do not care to name their village. Their identity centers on clan and lineage membership, and their villages are named by local Lao authorities. Village organization is also subject to district rules, which mandate a village headman be elected by household heads and report in with district authorities. Now it is his responsibility to settle disputes over land and cattle and minor domestic squabbles. Now he has no fixed term of office and he remains in his position as long as everyone is satisfied with his performance and he wishes to do so. Now successful headmen rely on elders to give them advice on these matters. Now, these matters can range from maintaining peaceful interpersonal relations to judging the proper length of time the rice must be uh, must lay fallow before replanting. Now, marriage among the home. Traditional Hmong marriages are arranged by the fathers of the bride and groom, with cross-cousin marriage the preferential form. Girls are generally married in their middle teens, boys from the ages of 18 to 20. Polygyny is permitted, though uncommon. Now, elopement is permitted traditionally as a, as a traditional alternative to an arranged match and is regarded as performative declaration of the desire to marry. 
Now, the boy and his friends would hide and then capture the girl with her happy participation, whose parents would then come to rescue her and receive a silver pister from the boy. The couple, having thus announced their intentions, the fathers would initiate marital negotiations. There's also no stigma attached to premarital sex among teenagers, and often pregnancy was a third route to marriage. Today, a boy will often send a friend with a silver coin to the girl's father as a request for negotiations to begin. Three days after the presentation of the coin, the couple spends a three-day period at the future groom's house. This visit begins the girl's entry into his clan, something to which the ancestral spirits must agree. During this time, ceremonies are performed to ensure the young couple's souls do not wander off. The girl in particular is at risk for this consequence because her incorporation into her betrothed group is a spiritually delicate business. Once this stay at the boy's house is complete, the families begin to negotiate in earnest, setting a bride price and payment for the celebration. The amount spent on the wedding reflects the wealth of the families and the size of the affair. The bride price is generally fixed by consolation between the village elders and the district authorities. Now, because bride price reflects a woman's potential for reproduction and labor, compensation varies. A girl who has never been married deems the highest price. A woman who have been widowed after less than six years of marriage demand a higher bride price than those who have been widowed following a marriage of six to ten years. Women who had been married more than ten years bring no bride price at all. Now there are also various fines which are levied around issues of pregnancy and refusal to marry. So that concludes lecture series three, part three. And as always, let's all try and make better mistakes tomorrow.